Welcome to uh, Citizen Impact, a project of the Miami Valley Full Employment Council. I'm the host, Logan Martinez. We have a great show tonight, uh, a lot of important stuff happening here in Dayton and around the world. Um, last Friday, the unemployment numbers came out, and the Miami Valley Full Employment Council is an advocacy group for unemployed and low-income people, and we're very concerned about the impact, even though they say unemployment is way down, uh, we still have very strong pockets of high unemployment in the city um, and around the country. The real level of unemployment, which we do every month uh, based on the, the statistics that come out from the Labor Department, shows that there officially there's six million unemployed workers. Uh, that's the official number, or 3.7 percent. But the real level of unemployment is much higher than that. Uh, we have what we call hidden unemployment. Uh, both people who have stopped looking and therefore not counted, and that's another 5.2 million people. Uh, and then there are millions and millions of people who are working part-time that would like to have a full-time job. And that currently is estimated to be at 4.6 million people. Or we have a total of 15.8 million workers that are unemployed or underemployed. And a lot of those people, uh, African-American unemployment is twice that for, uh, for white people. Uh, in low-income white communities, unemployment is much higher. And so you have structural unemployment, uh, especially among young people who can't even get a job at McDonald's because there's too many seniors taking those jobs or somebody. But uh, we still have un an unemployment problem in the United States. Uh, and uh, our group, along with the National Jobs for All Coalition, are working towards a national jobs bill that would create real full employment in our country and do away with the, a lot of the hardships that we see as a result of that, which includes poverty. And one of the things that came out that uh, was made national news, uh, there was a PBS program that talked about the problems of Dayton, and a third of the population of Dayton lives below the poverty line. And so unemployment, structural unemployment, and uh, just not being paid very well on a lot of jobs leaves a lot of people short. And uh, we have a lot of evictions and stuff. But we have a great show tonight. We have uh, professors from Wright State coming to talk about the budget crisis at Wright State. Uh, this is our second show on the budget crisis at Wright State. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I might point out this is the beginning of our 30th season. But we have a great guest. We have Jeffrey Owens, Dr. Owens. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And Dr. Farrell. Both of you with the, the American Association of Professor, uh, University Professors, okay. which is Correct. the union at Wright State. And um, you guys have been negotiating and waiting for a mm -hmm fact-finding uh, report that's going to come out shortly. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. Would one of you like to sort of like maybe just sort of outline where things stand right now at Wright State and as far mm -hmm. as this report and where we're, what we're looking at? Okay, I can uh, try to do that. As you probably know, I uh, serve uh, as our chapter vice president of uh, our chapter within Wright State University. And so I'm not actually part of the negotiating team, but uh, of course, you know, uh, the team keeps us apprised of, uh, you know, what's going on, what kind of progress is being made. And in turn, we try to, uh, you know, sort of make our uh, membership as aware as possible of progress or lack thereof uh, on these negotiations. And so, you know, there are, might be some things that are sort of in the course of negotiation that may change on a dime. There might be other things which, uh, you know, sort of are best not sort of widely disseminated, but, um, you know, we try to uh, keep everybody informed to the extent possible. Where we stand right now, uh, again, you know, sort of backing up a little bit, uh, we had, we usually ha normally have three year contracts. And, uh, you know, at the end of the three years, the administration, the uh, 
representatives of the AUP, uh, you know, faculty who themselves, you know, serve uh, kind of a double duty as um, negotiators uh, representing the bargaining unit faculty, will, uh, you know, sort of negotiate over uh, working job conditions, uh, issues of procedures, of um, health care benefits, you know, all the usual things <coughs> that you probably would expect uh, in any sort of labor contract. And normally, you know, they're very routine. You know, we have a, a fairly robust contract that uh, has kind of suited us over the last 20 years or so. And we tweak it depending on market conditions, you know, the cost of health care, maybe uh, if there are um, areas where maybe uh, wages have gotten out of sync with the, you know, prevailing wages for people in various uh, fields of, of study, then, you know, adjustments are usually made and, and things go very quickly. Unfortunately, what's happened is that uh, possibly due to some of the budgetary problems that uh, the administration has experienced over the last three or four years, uh, sort of abruptly those negotiations came to a halt in 2016. And, you know, there's been a little bit of nudging back and forth, but at, at this time uh, we really have made no progress. Hence, the uh, as if you've been following the uh, news, you may be aware that yeah, we're uh, we have a fact finder who we reported our various positions and our hopes to, and uh, uh, the fact finder uh, we hope will come up with uh, some findings October 29th, as he promised. And at that time, uh, again, we're going to be following, you know, the letter of Ohio State law regarding this procedure. We're going to very carefully look at the facts that the fact finder have found. You know, he's basically, he's not an, an arbitrator. He's not uh, negotiating on either side's behalf. <coughs> Rather, he's going to take a look at the positions for which we have disagreements or we can't see eye to eye. And he will simply, you know, sort of uh, split the difference. Uh, and he'll say simply, here are what I find for each of those articles for which you could not uh, come to an agreement up to that point. And at that point, uh, we have a number of options. Uh, we can say, oh, that looks satisfactory. We can bring it to our uh, rank and file uh, faculty. And if a majority of them uh, vote that, you know, we're satisfied with what the fact finder found, then uh, that will be our contract. Uh, or the other option would be that if there are one or more articles that we find unsatisfactory and um, a majority of our faculty uh, vote against ratifying that contract, then we are rejecting it. Uh, alternatively, of course, the administration will be doing the same thing. They'll be carefully looking over uh, the uh, fact finder's um, version of our contract. And at that point, they can do the exact same thing. They can pull their membership and decide to accept or reject the fact finder's report. And if either side rejects it, there's a couple of different things, again, under Ohio State law that could possibly happen at that point. Uh, again, uh, the, at this point, though, sort of the ball will be in the administration's hand. They can uh, you know, request that we resume negotiations. Uh, the other thing uh, at that point that they may be able to do, this is again, uh, you know, sort of something that is part of that uh, sort of legally spelled out procedure, is that they can uh, say, okay, here is our last best offer, take it or leave it. That could, you know, uh, and their last best offer can be, you know, uh, the same as a fact finder's report, but they also have the option at that point of, uh, uh, rewriting or you know adding or deleting materials from the fact finders report uh, to make a you know their contract not the fact finders contract and so it's still it's, it's it's just trying to bring you closer together uh, that's what the fact finder hopefully is doing it, it, we're hoping that actually it's a resolution you know mm -hmm. that uh, hopefully there will be something that both sides can live with and that will uh, be the end of it Unfortunately, that may not be the end of it. You know, uh, there is the strong possibility that, again, they could impose their last best offer, at which point, under Ohio State law, uh, we, are, we can accept that or we can strike at that point. So how far apart were you on prior to it going to fact-finding? Well, that's where, yeah, things are very highly unusual. In fact, um, uh, from what I heard from our bargaining team back in 2016 before uh, negotiations essentially stopped, they were expecting a very routine bargaining session. You know, typically it takes about a month. 
Uh, but unfortunately, what happened is uh, prior to fact finding, um, the administration put some articles on the table that, uh, to say the least, were extreme. Uh, very highly unusual. Uh, several of them um, proposed changes to the employment conditions of faculty at Wright State University that are utterly unlike anything else that exists, not only in any of our state institutions, not only utter, utterly unlike anything that exists in any uh, uh, AUP represented institution in the state of Ohio, but really working conditions that um, hardly resemble any um, institution of higher ed in the United States. So they, they proposed that, and this is before, mm -hmm. was this before the, the contract expired? Uh, the contract expired last summer. Yes, the uh, contract officially uh, and was supposed to end June 30th, 2017, but uh, before uh, negotiations resumed, uh, I believe it was probably in March of 2017, if I remember correctly, but don't quote me on that, um, the respective teams uh, signed uh, a set of ground rules that said until a new contract is ratified and if the old contract uh, expiration date passes, the terms of the old contract will continue until the new one is ratified. So mm -hmm. we are still working under a contract. The old um, contract, yes, a continuation. Mm -hmm. yes. so, uh, now along, along with that, in that timeline, in, in March of 2017, our previous president of the university resigned. And so mm -hmm. that complicated matters in yes. that we then had an interim president who mm -hmm. was not in a position to negotiate. Well, I, I wouldn't say he wasn't necessarily in a position to negotiate. You'll have to talk to the administration about exactly what powers he had or lacked. Her, right? In the oh, actually, that we're talking- That was our interim. No. Mm -hmm. And then our new president did come on board. Uh, okay. Yes, she came on board in, uh, later in the summer of 2000. Uh, yes. 17. Yeah, so in other words, we had uh, what was called, what they called an interim president. This is, again, something that is, uh, you know, un, unheard of in, in the history of Wright State University. But uh, uh, Craig... McCray. Uh, Dr. McCray. McCray. Yeah, McCray uh, served as an interim president. He was a uh, elderly. He had, re he had worked, um, I forget which university he worked at for many years. He had retired. So who yeah. made this proposal about work conditions? Uh, well, uh, it was presented to our bargaining team by uh, the attorney who, uh, when uh, almost at the ex precise time when McCray became our interim president, became the new chief bargaining, you know, the chief bargainer for the administration. So there was another gentleman who uh, had actually been doing this for many years who was serving as their chief negotiating officer up until. Um, March, I believe, of 2017, and almost the exact same time when uh, President Hopkins resigned and uh, McCray became the interim president, uh, there was a um, reorganization, shall we say, of the um, administration's negotiating team. And um, he was an attorney, uh, and I guess he had had some experience with uh, negotiating contracts in various uh, labor sectors, you know, custodial workers, uh, uh, technical workers, et cetera. Uh, as far as we know, he had no experience whatsoever working is he in still higher education. There? Yes, he is currently serving as their chief negotiator. So the same guy who made this proposal to change the working conditions yes. is still mm -hmm. overseeing the process. Yes. Of course, mm -hmm. that was his duty. You know, he, he is the one who puts um, mm -hmm. articles sure. on the table for negotiation. Again, that, I don't know if he wrote them or you know, uh, what, to what degree he uh, was involved in the drafting of them. But again, you know, that, yeah, he, he would be the one who actually you know, okay. put those in front of our let's um, step, team. Let's step back, because mm -hmm. uh, like I said, we did a show about this basically, I think, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that time, right before that, uh, the first time that the public heard that Wright State was in trouble, there was a proposal to have the presidential debate Mm -hmm. here at Wright State, and uh, I was reminded by a friend of mine about this, and, and uh, that was the first indication that there was some financial problems with the university because, you know, they, they had this big feather they were going to stick in their hat and had to drop it, mm -hmm. and, and and the reason they had to drop it was because of, well, they didn't have enough money to do the debates, 
but also that there were some financial irregularities at Wright State, yes. I would say irregularities. Mm -hmm. uh, on our at the last show, uh, there were several things that came up. Uh, one, that they had spent a lot of money investing in research and research projects and, and having people uh, uh, do that. There's a lot of money that goes into the athletics. One of the, the guests said that something about five or six hundred dollars of tuition of students go to the phys ed department. Mm -hmm. Athletics department, do you mean? Yeah. Yes. Uh, which is a big chunk of change for the average student to, to give. Yes. Mm -hmm. And actually that is not uh, atypical of a lot of public universities in the state of Ohio, in fact around the country. Uh, and in fact there's been a number of uh, news reports re recently. There was one done by uh, I think the um, Inside Higher Ed in conjunction with maybe ProPublica or one of the other uh, national news organizations in which they actually find that uh, a lot of public universities have um, NCAA uh, sports uh, teams, uh, very often Division I, and um, typically what happens is, of course, you know, it, that is a very expensive uh, club to be a, a member of, and uh, very commonly what happens is uh, some of the Big Ten universities, Ohio State and other large uh, market um, universities often can generate a profit from uh, you know, television, revenue, sales, et cetera. Even uh, in many cases in those very large universities, the uh, athletic program actually contributes money back into the coffers of the university for the educational mission. But for smaller ones, you know, Akron, you know, uh, you know, University of Cincinnati or Wright State, we have a Division I basketball team. Typically, uh, we our sports programs will be operating at a loss, and so as a result of that, um, the students effectively subsidize uh, NCAA athletics with their um, tuition dollars. Okay, do we have any idea about how much that runs? At this yeah, point? the uh, again the last number that I heard was approximate. Our you know our total budget for sports that would not just simply be you know our Division One basketball team, but you know all sports. Um, uh, runs around uh, 10 million dollars per year and um, what happened uh, under the administration of the interim president um, McCray. It, McCray mm -hmm. was that um, again you know they were looking you know at all budget items they you know they dug very deep into our spending to try to find any way to alleviate our uh, loss of money but when they um, hired McRae, the, under their contract, they specifically said that if you are going to, uh, you know, recommend uh, reducing uh, expenditures, you are to exempt uh, intercollegiate sports. And in fact, by the time he had completed his budget, you know, he managed to, you know, uh, salvage about, 30, I think over 30 million, if I remember correctly, in uh, savings. Uh, during his, you know, by you know doing that deep mm -hmm. search for uh, a revenue that could be um, eliminated, they actually mm -hmm. increased the uh, intercollegiate budget by approximately a million dollars. It was uh, some some nine nine point something uh, when he was hired. It was it hit that ten million dollar mark uh, by the time he had finished his uh, service here at Wright State University. Mm -hmm. So. Here we are now back at the future, or, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't seem, you know, I haven't paid all that close attention, but when the, the, the new president has spoken and when they've talked about the, the finances of the university, they neglect to even talk about the need to have a contract. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem like it's a real high priority for them to resolve this. I think that's the impression we're getting, um, that it seems like the board and administration would like to just wait and see what the fact finder comes up with. Um, there's, there's a danger in that though. Uh, here, here we all are um, working together with the same mission, the faculty and the administration. Um, it's my opinion that it would be good if there were talks going on the whole time, that conversation between the parties can't hurt, and that if we continue to work together to negotiate, we may be able to avert um, a, a strike. And that's the hope. 
of, of the faculty and, mm -hmm. and of our union representatives. Yeah, because effectively, you know, a strike is not good for anybody. You know, certainly, you know, as faculty, you know, it's disruptive to our uh, educational mission. Students, you know, we're here for the students. I mean, for many of us, that's the reason that we wake up in the morning and, and want to go to work, is that, uh, you know, um, they, they do kind of inspire us as well. Their education is going to be disrupted. Uh, we have community partners, you know, uh, that uh, we we serve. Uh, we have uh, faculty who, you know, not only teach students on campus, but uh, in other uh, areas throughout uh, the university. We have researchers who uh, work, for example, with the opioid epidemic here in Dayton, mm -hmm. Ohio, doing very uh, meaningful and and uh, helpful research that make people's lives better. I mean. That kind of stuff uh, gets disrupted when uh, there are these intractable labor disputes. Mm -hmm. um, what are the other stumbling blocks besides the working conditions? One of the things we've had a number of shows on labor mm -hmm. relations with uh, the mm -hmm. RTA, with uh, the Chinese glass plant. Uh, we've done a number of uh, different things, and healthcare seems to be a major mm -hmm. issue. Is healthcare mm -hmm. a, a issue in the contract? As a matter of fact, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's one of the. Do you want to? Uh, that is a stuff. I'll start mm -hmm. us off, and then you okay. probably know more mm -hmm. detail. Um, so uh, we would like for healthcare benefits to remain a negotiable item, to, to remain in the contract um, as part of the the um, uh, the collective bargaining agreement. But um, administration board of trustees would like to see healthcare benefits not in the contract, so that uh, they wouldn't have to negotiate about things such as the uh, number of tiers for uh, amount of premium to pay or, um, or the actual benefits and what type of plan it, that we would, could be offered. But uh, as the faculty believe, this is part of compensation and thus a part should sure. remain part of the collective yeah. bargaining. Well, agreement. actually, I could take that a step further. It's not just simply something that uh, we would like to bargain over. Under Ohio state law, it's a mandatory uh, topic of negotiations. You know, again, uh, you know, this is not something that we that we uh, just want. It's yeah, by law. Yeah, okay. and uh, so we're we're frankly quite baffled as to why uh, they're putting on the table a proposal to uh, simply say that, uh, well, you know, uh, you will be getting the same benefits as non-union uh, representative members of the university community, and what's more. Uh, if we should decide uh, to uh, change the terms of uh, the health care package uh, that we offer to you, we can do so at any time. As uh, probably many uh, of those who might have um, employee benefits that it might include health care know that typically there's a, um, a period, typically like November, December, where uh, there's open enrollment and you know if there is going to be any change in a health, an employer's health care plan that would be the time where you either you know do the appropriate adjustments or you might have to move into you know a new kind of plan uh, that open enrollment is not part of our contract they can simply say uh, with I think 90 days notice that uh, you know in the middle of June if they wanted uh, to, they could just simply change it. And what's interesting too is that typically, and again, this is very common in uh, sectors so where- So it's, oh. it's their option to change it at any time as it's read now? In the current language that they put on the table. In, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. in their proposal. Yeah. Yes. In their proposal. Okay, not, yeah. not the way it's being carried out under the current. No, cur under the current contract, we actually uh, are still working with uh, a, the, uh, range of, of packages and costs that we've enjoyed over the previous three years. Mm -hmm. And so effectively, if they, you know, for example, if they felt that there was a, a need to raise premiums or maybe, you know, lessen some of the programs, the more they delay, the more they pay. Because, you know, you know for example, <coughs> if there are costs of, cost of health care adjustments that they have to make. Since we are working under that previous contract, everything uh, mm -hmm. continues as it has since June of 2017. Now, now meanwhile, we've seen uh, the package that they offered to the staff, uh, yep. the administrative assistants, all the personnel who work in our front offices, mm -hmm. uh, and including chairs and deans, so yes. the non-bargaining unit faculty members uh, who are employees at Wright State. And uh, we've seen in the past year their 
health care package really deteriorated the, yeah. what they were offered and yeah. Get, yeah. given. And it, yeah, and as you know from yeah. in your yeah, as you know from uh, many other sectors, typically what would happen is the union represented employees would negotiate a health care package, and typically employers, uh, you know, maybe to uh, disincentivize having other uh, employees, uh, cons you know, consider unionizing very often will give the same benefits package to their non-unionized sure. employees. Mm -hmm. What they're asking is quite the opposite. What they're saying is that we have now uh, sort of gutted the yeah. health care options of our non-union <coughs> represented employees and we would like to write into the contract that whatever they get, the union uh, employees get. So, you know, we've seen this over mm -hmm. and over again. Healthcare is a major mm -hmm. stumbling block. In fact, on the bargaining table across the board, mm -hmm. uh, healthcare is an issue. Now, our group, the Full Employment Council, supports the single payer healthcare plan, mm -hmm. which would take it off the bargaining table yeah. and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody would have yes. universal health care of the mm -hmm. world class variety. Now, mm -hmm. and, but what we're getting is, is uh, hospital stays have become more expensive and so they're, they're trying to cut how long you stay in the hospital mm -hmm. regardless of how sick you are. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to squeeze people at both ends. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, one of the things that, that we believe is that a, a good uh, health care benefits package attracts good employees. And so uh, we, would, we would hate to see uh, in our next contract, we would hate to see a, a poor health care benefits plan because we mm -hmm. want to be able to attract high quality yeah. faculty to come to Dayton, come to Wright State and teach. Yeah, and certainly, you know, uh, many of the faculty, you know, kind of see this as their avocation. You know, they're very passionate about uh, the teaching. But we actually do have a number of uh, faculty, you know, for example, in the engineering, computer science, in business, et cetera, where, you know, they could uh, possibly, you know, uh, earn mo considerably higher salaries than they currently do at Wright State University, <coughs> but very often they opt not to. And uh, you know, usually they're motivated once again by the students, you know, the passion for uh, the love of learning, but at the same time too that many uh, might in part, you know, weigh their options in terms of, okay, I might uh, sacrifice a bit on salary, but they seem to have a very good health care plan, maybe there's a good retirement package, et cetera, that might be incentivized. Uh, going into higher education. It's going to be very difficult to attract people if, you know, we are not only worse, you know, than uh, every other uh, state institution in Ohio, but considerably worse than the private sector. So, um, is there a wage dispute any? Is there like, you know, are they mm -hmm. suggesting freezing people's salaries or? Yeah. Uh, they are, they are. Um, I suppose that's, that's to be expected, there is a financial, serious financial crisis, and um, but so the so the proposal that the administration has is for zero percent raises for each of the next three years. Yeah, which effectively represents a, a pay cut if you if you assume that the cost of living is perpetually increasing. Mm -hmm. But we're you know at this point we are willing to. Uh, talk openly, you know, we're willing to negotiate. That is the nature of negotiations. I mean, a, a contract is not only something that benefits us, but of course the, it is the administration's agreement as well that, you know, hopefully they will, um, you know, benefit uh, with whatever uh, fiscal or uh, need, other needs that they are looking to get out of that contract as well. Mm -hmm. And so we are prepared, if absolutely necessary, to forego raises in the immediate future if we can uh, take care of some of the more uh, serious and egregious things that they've put on the table. If we can, we mm -hmm. can get past those, uh, I suppose, you know, we probably won't be happy uh, to take uh, zero raises in the, in the short term, but if necessary, that might be something that will be uh, talked about at that negotiating table. Right, it's, so, a, it's a give and take. <coughs> and, uh, there are some other articles that we're actually more concerned about, the, these other articles that have to do with with really the structure of the workforce. For example, um, uh, um, an article that uh, would allow retrenchment, meaning letting go of tenured faculty. Um, well, you know, or all faculty in, in some form or another. Yeah, and, the, and uh, our, for our non-tenure track faculty, extending the period of time until they have a continuing contract. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's these sorts of things that, that 
most faculty will point to first. It's these sort of working conditions that are, that would be, it would be hard to change them back later. So some mm -hmm. very drastic changes to the structure of the, of the teaching workforce. Mm -hmm. Those sure. are the sorts of things that are a little more. So the tenure is, is, is very important mm -hmm. to college professors. Uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, and and mm -hmm. K-12 teachers. Sure. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, your ability once you've worked so long to have a lifetime job based on certain if you you know do certain mm -hmm. illegal things you can get yeah. fired well uh, if I could clarify a little bit because sure. I think there Go is ahead. a lot of uh, misunderstanding the public on the nature of tenure uh, the first thing about tenure is that um, you know I, I am a tenure professor I think we're both tenured mm -hmm. you know, we're very mm -hmm. uh, fortunate in that respect but um, we can be fired for cause Sure. You know, that, you know, I want to make it clear to your uh, listeners that um, you know that is a possibility. If uh, you know we are uh, grossly incompetent in the classroom, or heaven forbid, you know uh, I were to commit a, an act of sexual harassment, for example, uh, the university is justified in taking the necessary steps to um, alleviate those egregious behaviors, up to and including uh, removing me or any other faculty from Can uh, do the that position. With the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, I wish. Well, I'm uh, sorry. I, if there's I, I, evidence, but um, <laughs> but, um, but that yeah. You know, um, the thing is, though, that one of the things about tenure is just simply, and this is also in K through 12, is that it uh, it mandates due process. Sure. You can't just simply Doesn't say. Doesn't the contract do that though as well? I mean, I mean if yeah. you're covered under the contract, mm -hmm. but yeah. if they're mm -hmm. if they're laying off now, they've already laid off professors last year, right? Uh, yes, and what happened? Yeah, it's kind of complicated because we have the tenure, uh, tenured faculty. We have tenure eligible, and again, you know, you you don't automatically get tenure when you show up, uh, but <laughs> you go through a probationary period of, of usually six years in mm -hmm. which you produce scholarship and you know show mm -hmm. your your competence that you deserve that that promotion, as it were. Not everyone earns that tenure. Yes. I mean, I, I I have colleagues who didn't didn't make it. Uh, so during those first six years, you you must uh, produce in the scholarly areas. Yep. Uh, you must publish. You must obtain grants. It depends on your department's bylaws. Yep. Show and your, your yep. so your department decides whether you get tenure. Uh, it's not the administration. It goes well, all the way a, through. Yeah, the it actually it, it's a uh, a collaboration of administrators and uh, okay. fellow there faculty. There are votes at every yeah. level. Okay. Votes at every level. Step back yeah. now. They. A couple of weeks ago, they announced that the, tu the um, tuitions, uh, the enrollment was down slightly, yes. mm -hmm. and there was a slight drop in, in income this semester. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't seem like it was that substantial, but it uh, it seems like uh, you guys might be being set up as a test case here. That um, mm, not sure. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, they're suggesting these work rules that are unusual. Oh, I see yeah. where you're going. And, and um, that is a, you know, a red flag there that they're actually considering something that's, that's off the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that, I think, it, in my opinion, our board is trying to take this opportunity at a time when the university is is still working to come out of the financial mm -hmm. crisis, and but by the way, there is some good news on that on that front. There have been savings due to the um, the austerity measures that the faculty and staff have are living under, um, and and uh, that the president and the new chief business officer have mm -hmm. have implemented. These austerity measures are leading to the point where we're. It looks like we may have ten million dollars in reserves by the end of this year. Yep. And, and that is absolutely necessary. Yeah. So, but I think what's happening is that the board is taking this opportunity of having come through and still fighting this serious financial crisis to do whatever they can to create a situation where they have a more flexible workforce. Yeah. So, for example, tenure is sort of an obstacle to that. You have to plan well to know whether you yeah, can- But isn't, isn't tenure so much part of the university framework at this point. Absolutely. The notion yeah. of, of trying to take away tenure. Yeah. And yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. There's, there's another component to tenure that I didn't talk about earlier, which is, uh, yeah. and this is something that uh, for the past hundred years the AUP has been really talking about, is that 
Um, it is also a mark of professionalism. You know, it's, it, it's kind of a, an indicator that, uh, you know, we've gone through our probationary period, we have been, you know, promoted, granted tenure, mm -hmm. that shows that, you know, we are trusted to, you know, deliver a professional world-class education. We can work autonomously in, in the classroom. And very importantly, we, we often talk about tenure in, in conjunction with academic freedom. In other words, that you know, they as a professional, they will trust us that when we disseminate knowledge in the classroom, it is you know current, it is uh, the appropriate uh, you know taught at the appropriate level to students, and that there's nobody who is going to be second guessing the substance of what we're doing there. And mm -hmm. um, you know that and sometimes, for example, in my college, the College of Liberal Arts. You know, I, I actually teach social sciences, but we also have people in the humanities. You know, sometimes we touch upon uh, controversial social issues. But again, you know, because we have tenure, uh, the expectation here is that we will, you know, deal with them honestly, you know, equitably, fairly, uh, and without fear that perhaps, you know, if uh, we touch upon a topic that is sort of politically sensitive in the general public at this current time, that somebody's not going to say, oh, it sounds like you uh, represent somebody who is uh, um, instigating students by, uh, you know, raising politically controversial issues. We feel that you don't deserve to be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's an important part of tenure as well. That uh, again, if there if there's anything that sort of undermines that, it you know it uh, makes us very uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, free speech in the classroom is under attack. Yes. Uh, but it brings with it. I mean, it, it's a it, it it's a right, but brings with it responsibilities mm -hmm. as well to approach your teaching and your conversation with students in a very professional manner to base mm -hmm. your comments on the research literature to help open students' minds, not close them. Yeah. Um, sure. But also so. make sure that we don't with, withhold um, exposing students to uncomfortable or controversial issues, mm -hmm. which is ultimately doing them a disservice. So, so, well, so we won't go too far into yeah, that. That's a whole other yeah. program so, probably. So, uh, so how it relates to our contract is that uh, um, we would like a contract that's fair to the faculty who are tenured or tenure track and to those who are not in the tenure tracks, so those um, who don't have the terminal degree, but who we rely on for, for teaching, um, maybe not so much for research on their part, but uh, for teaching. And so what we're looking for is these working conditions that would not allow um, quick decisions to be made about uh, um, uh, what non um, continuation of contracts for the non-tenure track or reduction in the tenured teaching force. We, we would like what we currently have as far as the tenured faculty, which is a process for determining if the financial situation in that department or that college is such that some trimming needs to take place. But, but the article that's on the table is much more extreme than that. So, mm -hmm. sure. so it's those sorts of things that we're... Sure, that so it doesn't we would really, be, and, and that, the article doesn't sound like the article is on the, that they're proposed to, to change the relationship really is based on necessarily financial considerations as much as it... We think it would make it too easy um, sure. to well, you already you have to have a certain core faculty. faculty to carry the, 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 mm -hmm. the, right. the student body. Right. Uh, and it's too drastic a measure to change it in such a drastic way uh, when the problems, the financial problems we're having now are short term. And Sure. Um, so let's go back to where we're looking at a deadline at the, or a, 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 a fact-finding mm -hmm. report that's due at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. um, and it's either going to come, come back and make a number of proposals, but both management, the administration, and the, the, the professors get to review that mm -hmm. and decide, and, and there'll be a dialogue on trying to find common ground, right? We certainly hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the concern is that uh, what happens if you don't find common ground? Um, there is a a, f a vote by the faculty mm -hmm. on whether where to go from here or right so yeah. so the first vote that would take place is whether or not to accept the fact finders report and it's um, 
sixty percent of the regular chapter members. Yes, uh, yeah, um, as prescribed in our our uh, AUP constitution. So we have a chapter constitution that outlines these procedures. And yes, you're correct that it's uh, it would require two thirds of the fac faculty. Two to thirds or sixty percent. Sixty percent. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, sixty percent uh, to reject the fact finder's report or accept it. Or accept it. Correct. Or accept so it. if if uh, well um, well. If 60% or more say, no, this fact finder's report, I do not accept that as my next contract, then, um, then we're rejecting it. So mm -hmm. if only 55% reject it, then we, have, uh, we would be essentially accepting it. Sure. So, so it, it has to be ex rejected by a, a, a takes three -fifths lar of large the majority. Yep. Yes. And if that happens, uh, is the administration free to institute whatever it wants? Uh, well, it, it isn't necessarily that that would be the next step. Once again, uh, the administration will make their decision whether to accept or reject. And then th one of the options would be to return to the bargaining table. Mm -hmm. um, and in that event, uh, they could do what is typically to talked about in labor uh, jargon as being surface bargaining, where you know they're not really, uh, you know, sort of actively uh, trying to come to a, a serious resolution. Uh, and again, according to Ohio state law, if we whether they negotiate in good faith or not, but if we continue to be at an impasse, that's when uh, law prescribes that they can have the option of imposing their last best offer on the faculty. And how long after the fact finding report? Uh, to be honest, if negotiations were to resume, uh, I don't think that there is a, a, uh, a clock going in terms of that, um, that process. But um, again, if one or both sides reject it and uh, imposition happens you know, without negotiation, then at that point, what we, you know, uh, what we would do is we would report to uh, CERB that, um, you know, what date we intend to to strike. I think there's a, a ten day, yeah, we a ten day notification, if I recall, under Ohio state law. So the clock, the clock that ticks is uh, when the fact finder's report comes out. There's a week. Yes. During which the voting takes place, and then. Uh, so you're going to vote immediately. Within the week. Yeah, well, well, what we'll do, the executive mm -hmm. committee will carefully review what the fact finder reports, and we will uh, inform the constitu our constituency, the rest of the bargaining unit faculty, uh, what we found, and mm -hmm. we'll offer a recommendation, and then uh, there'll be a, a period, of, I believe, a, a week to About a week for the vote. voting. Correct. And then um, once the voting takes place, suppose that it doesn't, that we that one side or the other doesn't accept the the fact finders report, um, suppose that it's the faculty who don't accept it. They, we cannot call a strike right away. There's a mm -hmm. clock that says, and I think it's about 10 days, mm -hmm. uh, there's a rule that- Do you have to take a second vote? No, then no. that's to allow some time for negotiating. So which, is, which is good. The, so you effectively, the, uh, a vote by the faculty to reject the fact finders report would also represent an off, uh, well, you know, would represent that we, are prepared to strike if these other steps are not uh, do not lead to a resolution. So, if 60% of the faculty reject the fact finding report, the regular chapter members, yes. right? The then there is a period of if there's no negotiations, would the executive board decide then if you're going on strike or not, or how does that how will that work? Yeah, at that at that point, you know, once all of those other um, procedures are exhausted, we would notify CERB that, uh, you know, of, give them that 10-day notice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Currently, you're working under the previous contract. Mm -hmm. uh, under the previous contract, you have the same health care that you had for the past, since 2014. Mm -hmm. Are, under the uh, current, uh, under this current situation, are, you, are they giving oh. tenure to people? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah, so that procedure, okay. so far as we know, is still proceeding normally. Mm -hmm. So they're still, still. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. The now we have a hiring freeze. So we we've been under a hiring freeze since 2016. So, 
Um, so there, there's no new faculty of any kind? Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's very, a, a very few. Yeah, few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, Programs yes, that were growing, for example, that, that end. Or if you have uh, an absolute hole and you have to have Exactly. Have in, yeah. in uh, I think it was 2016, 17, we had the early retirement incentive. So some faculty mm -hmm. left. Yeah, I've, several friends of mine retired. Right. right. I mean, since 2015 until now, We've, uh, we have 90 fewer tenured faculty than we did. We went from 650 to 560 um, Since 2016. Tenured, tenure right. track yep. faculty members. So, right. so you're like down so 90 people. We're down 90 Correct. people. And, and so that's just, uh, well, let's see, I think the 90 includes non-tenure track. I think I might A combination have of both yeah, of them, yeah, yes, yeah. correct. So how many professors so, are there at Wright State total, do you know? Or? Well, uh, so professor is a term I, I would, um, that is a rank within the sure. faculty and then you have associate professors and you have assistant professors and you have lecturers and instructors but when you put all the the, the faculty together who teach who uh, yeah, uh, regularly 90, interact yeah, with the students. 90 represent uh, members of our bargaining unit yeah, mm -hmm. yeah right Correct. so because mm -hmm. we're not counting adjuncts or lecturers part-time no, no they, they're, they're not, not covered members. under the contract right correct correct uh, uh, lecturers are but not part-time faculty we uh, have a category of faculty called okay. lecturers who are full-time okay Mm -hmm. uh, Lecturers, instructors. So are, yeah. the semester ends before Thanksgiving? No, uh, uh, mid December. Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. it goes till mid December. We have two weeks of classes and a week of final exams after Thanksgiving. Okay, so the, there's a possibility there will be a strike at Wright State, maybe? Boy, we hope not, but. Yeah. Once again, if, uh, we're, well, the thing is that yeah, we're. I think everybody's hoping that we can alleviate the strike, you know, avoid that altogether. But, but we, uh, we, we have to be prepared. Yeah. We, we have won't to, accept yeah. a contract that that um, contains these drastic measures that, as you said earlier in our conversation, that have really raised a red flag about the intentions of the board, um, because. Uh, you know, they, they clearly indicate a desire for a more flexible workforce. They would like to, for the non-tenure track faculty, our instructors, our lecturers, our senior lecturers, who carry a heavier teaching load, uh, they would like to extend the period of time, the number of years it takes for them to get a continuing contract. Right now, those folks come in as instructors, uh, typically, they start at the instructor rank, and they have one-year contracts. At their sixth year, we have to decide, either we offer them a continuing contract or we let them go. The, uh, and the, the board would like- continuing contract, is that the same as tenure? No. No, that's different. No, actually even, uh, again, tenure mm -hmm. is actually uh, codified within Ohio State law as well. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there, it is recognized, but the non-tenure eligible faculty uh, have these series of contracts and their job security, if you will, is for all intents and purposes uh, under the collective bargaining agreement. There is no, you know, uh, Ohio state law or anything like that mm -hmm. that uh, outlines that this is, uh, this procedure is, um, you know, something that is uh, a regular process at our university. Mm -hmm. So the board would like to extend that six year wait for a continuing contract to be nine to 12 years. And these are people who are in the bargaining unit. They, oh, they, they definitely are. So yeah. when a person gets hired as a, just to start teaching there. Mm -hmm. So they may have a master's degree. They, they would have to have a master's degree sure, in yes. their field to be hired as an instructor. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so do you know of any other university that's on strike anywhere in the country at this point? At this moment? At this moment, I don't, I don't no. know. No, I'm not uh, aware of any. I any, think we would hear, but I don't. Yes, but, uh, but I don't. We uh, we heard, you know, about other institutions in recent history that have uh, yeah. struck, but well, uh, I haven't I heard of anything of, recent. Is Kent heard. State in contract negotiations right now? It's entirely possible, but I'm not aware of that. I think Kent yeah. State's faculty are currently in negotiation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so uh, the any idea if they're in a very similar boat? That would be a good question. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I read one. I I was I read because one thing. I don't know the details of it, but it seemed like they share some of the some of the angst that we do sure, you know, about the, the things we've talked the about. The things that you know, we we like I said, healthcare has been under attack mm -hmm. for uh, mm -hmm. workers. You know, and and uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that we know uh, from the work we've done with single payer, 
uh, is that an average of two people die each day prematurely in Ohio mm -hmm. because they don't have health insurance. Mm -hmm. Two people a day. Uh, and so it's a life and death issue. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I assume it's not for professors or for a lot of workers who take care of themselves, mm -hmm. but for the working public mm -hmm. and for w the mm -hmm. community, it's a huge issue. It's a huge mm -hmm. issue. And, and, well, uh, if you don't have your health, you don't have a lot. As right. a matter of fact, it's very ironic because, um, you know, while we are able to maintain our, uh, our current contracts health care program, recently, you know, due to budget cuts, they eliminated a wellness program they, they had instituted a few years ago. So, again, it's an employee wellness program that, um, you know, uh, gives incentives and, you know, gives opportunities to uh, employees who, uh, you know, improve their health try to improve their health, which... The rationale behind it is that it should be a cost-saving measure because if our employees are healthier, they'll be using less of the costly health insurance. Uh, and sure. so kind of a, a little odd decision I would, on their part if they are concerned that health care is yeah, too expensive. Well, they're they're to, yeah. looking towards the big picture and they're going to cut every yeah. edge. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sort of obliged uh, as an advocate here for low-income and unemployed people, and we talked at the beginning mm -hmm. of the show about the level of unemployment that... Uh, the Full Employment Council supports not only single payer, but we also mm -hmm. support national job legislation that would eliminate unemployment mm -hmm. and make you know the whole full employment a real issue. But we only have a few minutes left. Well, mm -hmm. can I connect education? Sure. So go ahead. Employment and education, right? And poverty and education. That if we can continue to provide good education to our students, if our wonderful community college in town can can do that as well. At uh, you know, at low cost, then we can help that those members of the Miami Valley, those families who are struggling with poverty, if we can get them into an associate's degree program, or boy, if they can continue to a four-year degree, we increase their chances for a higher salary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it um, definitely increases your income level to get mm -hmm. education. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't increase your ability to get a job when there are none. And when I, we, that's we, true. There we've needs lost 150,000 manufacturing jobs here mm -hmm. in Dayton. And the unions, Dayton used to be the 10th largest union market in the whole country. We had, yes. the, wow. yeah. and, and yeah. I don't think we're in the top 40 now. We need manufacturing, uh, right? We need but, tool uh, and die. We, need we the, the Unemployment Council and the community, really support the teachers and professors there and that uh, we want to see you guys get a good contract that one that recognizes your rights and, and, and protects both you and the students because if you know, if you're not your health is not good or if you're not being paid well you're not going to be teaching we so in the next five minutes what would you like to see the community rally behind you how you can we help you support your efforts out there yeah, well, I, I, I just sort of building on what you just said a moment ago, I mean, uh, uh, what I'd like to say to the Dayton community is this is your university. You know, it, when it was founded back in the early 1960s, you know, the vision was that it would be a, a community university, you know, that served the needs of people in the greater Dayton area. And so, you know, we're trying to st stay true to that mission that uh, they, the founders did all those years ago. Uh, there's a number of uh, ways in which uh, community members can express support for Wright State University and its faculty and its students. Uh, we do have a petition circulating and, you know, we can leave you with uh, information on, uh, you know, how to uh, access that online. Uh, many community leaders have uh, stepped up to express support, uh, often through writing letters to the trustees, to uh, President Schrader. Uh, and others at Wright State University to say, you know, let's uh, work together and try to uh, find a solution to this. And, you know, uh, we're uh, planning a number of public events. We're uh, looking at having a press conference on October 19th. There's going to be a, uh, a monthly uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees. And so, uh, you know, we've been trying to attend those regularly for the purposes of keeping informed about what's going on administratively, but also to sort of communicate uh, that, you know, we are, uh, we are very interested in coming to some sort of solution. 8.30 a.m. Student Union, October yep. 19th. That's the next Board of Trustees meeting. So. A.m. or p.m.? A.m. 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 In the morning. And mm -hmm. what day of the week is that? A Friday. It's a Friday morning. Right. Um, in week from this Friday. That's right. That's so. right. So it's those sorts of, th of 
things where we can show support, show um, for, for us as faculty, we, we, have, we have questions for our Board of Trustees. Are you watching the money? Uh, we, we saw problems in the past. Are you supporting the educational mission of this university? Are you um, protecting the academics and, and being careful so that we can continue to provide a good education? Well, it seems to me that, um, and it, we'll see what the fact finder says, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. consider what they put on the board and what they've been saying up to this point, they, they don't seem to be that interested in, in reaching an agreement. And that, I hope that is changes. Uh, not a good sign. Uh, our experience here is that uh, everything comes down to the wire. The RTA bus drivers, uh, mm -hmm. all, all the, the workers in, in Dayton that we've worked with in the past, the, yeah. the companies have gotten very conservative and right wing, as yes. the country leadership has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the notion of having rights as a worker is something that we have to sacrifice for the greater profit. <laughs> I hate yeah. to say that, and but we're not for profit. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So well, our yeah, there's a, a term that's bandied about a lot mm -hmm. in higher education: the corporatization of uh, higher education. And again, you all probably heard that term used with respect to K through 12. And um, an educational institution is, you know, not only a community asset, but it is something that's kind of unique. There really is nothing quite like it, and certainly, it, it the, it's. Um, its contribution and its needs are not the equivalent of a, a private for-profit business. They just really aren't, they are apples and oranges. There really is no way to use one model for the other. Nor would we expect a corporation to act like a university. I don't think yeah, that would be well, practical either. Mm -hmm. no, well, they, they certainly don't. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we've, you know, I went to Wright State and, and got a, you know, had a lot of great interaction with the teachers there and with the mm -hmm. students there and really helped form my life. And uh, I'm sure thousands and thousands of people out in the Dayton community have had that experience at Wright State. And uh, we appreciate your efforts on the part, you know, on the part of students and on your your own rights here, which you're, you're standing up and... Uh, and those mm -hmm. are the, the younger we faculty. That. We make our careers there. And those are the future mm -hmm. faculty whom we'd like to hire yep. when it's time. Well, thank you very much. We'll be thank watching uh, and uh, we in solidarity will call on the Dayton community to stand with the professors at Wright State and to stand with you guys and uh, to be an active citizen. We, we, we have uh, been promoting, the, uh, this is like I, you pointed out earlier, this is our 30th season of Citizen Impact and we believe that uh, the community has to be engaged to really safeguard and to change for the better. So thanks Thank for coming you. out. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.